All right, good morning. Hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. We uh, had a good one here. It's fun. Got to hang out with the Boyd family and eat lots of turkey and ham and sweet potatoes and mashed potatoes. And it, it was fantastic. So, um, so we're going to be looking today. We're going to be in an Old Testament book, uh, the book of Jonah. And there's some things that I think we can see in this story that every single one of us can apply to our lives. And, and my big idea this morning is that thankfulness changes everything. It changes everything. We live in a culture today that is a very discontent. There's, all, there's this, this sense of, of discontent in culture, in, our, in people. Uh, there's even a sense of uh, where people have, have become very sarcastic in their lives, uh, even jaded. That people are jaded towards God, towards the church, towards institutions, towards these things. And we're going to see this guy, Jonah, who is in a very difficult predicament. He's very jaded. I mean, yes, he, he knows about God. He has this relationship with God. And God, in chapter 1, is going to come to him, and God is going to say to him, to Jonah, Jonah, hey, listen, I want you to go, and I want you to bring my news to this group of people from Nineveh, the Ninevites, who are some of the most ruthless, reckless people in his entire surroundings. And God's going to call Jonah and, 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 and say, hey, listen, I want you to go because I actually want to extend my grace and my mercy to them. And Jonah, because of what's going on in his own heart, in his own life, says no. He actually goes the exact opposite direction of where God sends him. And so he finds himself in this predicament where he's in the belly of a whale in chapter 2. Now, many people have a hard time with this particular passage of Scripture because they say, like, really? Like, is the Bible really true? Like, did Jonah really spend three days in the belly of a whale. Now listen, I'm, I, will, I did a little bit of research this week, and I will tell you that somebody surviving for three days in the belly of a whale is very, very unlikely. It's not impossible. Most researchers will tell you, hey, if you get past the teeth and you don't get in the digestive system, you're probably not going to have enough air. But the reality is, it's highly improbable, but it's not impossible. So Jonah finds himself in this situation, and I really want to look at three things that he did in his life that got him out of a dark place that got literally, not just figuratively, because we can all end up in dark places. Amen? Amen. We can all end up in dark places in our heart, in our minds, uh, in our faith, in our, in our walk with God. So let's pick it up. We're going to start in Jonah chapter 2. And this idea of that thanksgiving changes everything. Let me just say this at the beginning. A great theologian, Andrew Bonner, said this. That thanksgiving is the very air of heaven. It's the very air of should be the very air of a believer. And we're going to look at that here in a minute in Revelation chapter 11. But let's pick it up in Jonah. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord. And he answered me. That's what we sang about this morning. Praise God that we have a God that actually hears us. And that cares about us. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. 
and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. Listen, most of the time in the Bible, you you see this idea that's referenced in the New Testament that first the, the natural, then the spiritual. There's this principle that many times we see that a lot of times David fought an actual Goliath Many times in our lives, we have actual enemies, spiritual enemies that we have to fight. So many times, so what is happening with Jonah here, Jonah is in an incredibly dark place physically, right? But it can be representative of us being in a dark place spiritually, relationally. So it goes on to say, so he says, man, you hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, the currents swirled about me all your waves and breakers swept over me I said I have been banished from your sight yet I will look again towards your holy temple the engulfing waters threatened me the deep surrounded me seaweed was wrapped around my head to the roots of the mountains I sank down the earth beneath barred me in bare Yeah, barred me in forever, but you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise and the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah on to dry dry land. So three things that I want to pull out of this passage of Scripture that we can apply in our lives, because our default mode, our propensity, can be to become negative to become critical, to become disenfranchised. That's that's everything in culture, everything in the world. Everything is pulling us into this place. Jonah was in this place. But look at what he did. First thing is this. So three turning points to go from hard difficulty to breakthrough. Number one, practice remembering the Lord. Remembering the Lord. Look at what it said in verse 7. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy mountain. All through the Old Testament, literally hundreds of times, there is this same picture where God was reminding and calling his people Remember me. Remember me in your difficulty. Remember me in Egypt. Remember me in the lion's den. Remember me in the cave. Remember, rem- remember me. So one of the first things, that one of the turning points for Jonah is that he didn't just get overwhelmed with his circumstances. He, he remembered the Lord who God was, what he could do in his life. Second thing that he did, he practiced moving his perspective from his circumstances to God. So what, what, what are you looking at? Look at what verse 4 says again. So he not only said, I remembered you, Lord, but he says, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. So again, it's so easy in our life to what we gaze upon, like Donnie said a few minutes ago, is the circumstances that seem overwhelming, and God is a God who is is so much bigger than our circumstances. You think about in the Old Testament, 
There's an example where Elisha has this servant of his. And they're out and they're in a place where the armies were surrounding them on the the mountain. And, And he's getting overwhelmed. He's getting anxious. He's getting fearful. This is not look like a good situation, dude. Elisha, what are you doing? We're out here. We're trapped. We're going to die. This is going to be fatal to us. And yet Elisha has this peace about him. And he says to his servant, he says, hey, listen, I'm going to pray for you that God would open your eyes and you would begin to see reality, not just the circumstances. And he prayed for him, and all of a sudden, this servant saw that the armies of the living God had surrounded all the other armies. And all of a sudden, he he got a picture of how big and strong and great God was. And his circumstance got smaller. I love this song. Years ago, my wife April, who is in the elementary ministry today, and uh, she used to choreograph lots of dances, and they would go and do these dances, and man, went to Russia one time and got a chance to go into all these schools and orphanages through dance, because they wouldn't let you come in and preach the gospel, but they would let you come in and do dance, and I'll never forget, she was working on this one dance with Linda was in it as well. And they were at our house upstairs, and I'd never heard this song before. And all of a sudden, I heard this song coming from our upstairs game room that April had turned into a dance room. And it's it's a song, it says, be magnified, O God, for you are highly exalted. Be magnified, O oh Lord, you are highly exalted. There's nothing you can't do, O oh Lord, my eyes are on you. And then it gets to this point, it says, Lord, forgive me, for I have responded to men instead of your grace and your mercy. Be magnified, God, be magnified in my life. And I remember sitting there. I'd never heard that song before. It was Don Moen singing. And, they're, and I'm like weeping. Because God was not being magnified in my life. My troubles and my circumstances and my lack and was, was what was being magnified. Trying to get my kids to bed on time. Cleaning dirty diapers at 2 in the morning and throw up in the playpen. Be magnified, God. You are bigger than the dirty playpen. Hallelujah. Practice moving your perspective from your circumstances to God. That's what he did. Immediately, his circumstances did not change. But there was a God who could change his circumstances like this. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. Last. Practice praising and thanking God in every circumstance. The Bible says this is the will of God, right? That we be thankful in all circumstances. In all circumstances. Look at Revelation 11. This is the, in in Revelation chapter 11, this is the last place that we see thanksgiving taking place. All through heaven, thanksgiving is taking place. When they see God, they fall down, they begin to worship, they're thanking Him, right? It's this constant. This, this group of people, it used to blow my mind when I would read it. And it said, forever and ever and ever, they will give thanks and praise to God. When we see his goodness. Guys, 
years ago, I was watching this little 15-minute theological conversation that a pastor in St. Louis was having with a theologian, and he said, hey, I struggle with this whole idea of hell. I struggle with it. And he said, you know, there's, there's three great mysteries in the Bible. The Trinity, the Incarnation, and God's, how, can, how could God's goodness come out of this? And he said, at the end, he said, guys, this is, he said, Revelations says that in the end, when all of us stand before God and all of us see what he has done from beginning to end, from eternity past to eternity future, when all of us see everything like a good movie, Revelation says that we will praise him for his goodness, his mercy, his grace, his loving kindness, and we will also praise him for his justice. We will see it and we will go, God, you are so amazing. You are so good. You are so powerful. You are so loving. You are so gracious. But Revelation chapter 11 is the last time that we see thanksgiving happening in heaven. Revelation 19 is the last time we see praise happening in heaven. Look at what it says. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, guys, this is about getting perspective. They have a perspective that God wants us to get. So this is what's happening here. They say the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders representing all of redeemed humanity, that's what they represent, all of redeemed creation, who were seated on the thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. We get a powerful perspective of God's victory of his goodness. God is sovereign, he's powerful, he's just, he's good. This is what Jonah, when it says that he remembered, when it says that he looked to God's holy temple, this is what he's, he was doing. But look at what verse 9 says. But I, with shouts, shouts, in, the, in a dark place, in a difficult place. But I, with shouts of grateful praise and the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. Years ago, I'll end with this, guys. Years ago, I went to my bookshelf one time and I was, had a little bit of extra time and I was going to just read for about 15, 20 minutes and I saw this weird book that had a very simplistic cover on it, Power of Praise, by an author named Carruthers. Looked old. I don't even know how I got the book. I don't know if April put it at something. I remember pulling out the book, and I began to read. And he said something right in the beginning of chapter 1. He said, a testimony of a family. And they said, my father was an alcoholic for 31 years. And all we did was we were disappointed. We were upset. When we prayed to God, it was all about, God, change him. And, and, and that's all fine. And they said, one day they got convicted when they read 1 Thessalonians when it says 
Give thanks to God in all circumstances, in all situations, not when it's just going exactly how we want. Wait a minute, time out. This is what they said in the book. Time out. You're telling me that I'm supposed to give thanks for what's going on with my dad? Yeah. You're, I'm supposed to give thanks for my children who are going through hard times and in rebellion and who've walked away from God? Yes. What? Yes. God is sovereign. He's sovereign. And they begin to say, they say, so they go, okay, we're going to begin to just thank God for the situation that dad is in. God, we trust you. We're going to thank you. Read it in the book. You can just go online. Type in power of praise, Carruthers, C-A-R-O-T-H-E-R-S. Read chapter. You can pull it up in Amazon. Chapter one's right there. You can read this story. They begin to just thank God for the situation. That night, his dad and mom come over. They're sitting there around the table, and all of a sudden, his, uh, their dad says, hey, what do you, this is back in the, what do you think about this Jesus movement stuff and all these young people coming to Christ? Do you think this is real? And they have a conversation about Jesus, and the children get to tell their father about the way that God had worked in their life, and he gets born again that night. Now, that doesn't always happen. They said, this is crazy. For 31 or 39 years, we complained about that, and when we went to God, it was all, God, change him, change him, change him. He said, now, it doesn't always happen this way, but the first day, we began to thank God for the circumstance that he was in. Something happened, and he, he gave his life to the Lord. And I kept reading years ago. And I said, okay, this sounds a little bit like mental gymnastics. Okay, so I'm supposed to. And God spoke to me. And he said, Dave, if Jacob was your son in the Old Testament, you would have been a helicopter parent. And you would have come in. And you would have tried to save him from going everything that I was taking him through to actually bring him to myself. You wouldn't have wanted him to go through what he went through, fleeing and going to Laban's and getting tricked and deceived. You wouldn't wanted him to then have to flee there. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have wanted him to have to go through a place where his hip was... You would have, you would have, because all of us, we don't want ourselves or anybody else to ever have to go through any kind of difficult situation. But yet God used those very circumstances and situations. Jacob's ladder, Jacob fleeing, Laban's trickery, everything to actually bring him to the place where he became Israel. First Thessalonians says, thank God in every circumstance. I'm telling you, life and death is in the power of the tongue. It's so easy to just get into the same river and the same current of being critical and being negative and being speaking words of unbelief, all this stuff out of our life. My three things, guys, that we can take away right now that, that Jonah did in those little passages in Jonah 2. Dark place, seaweed around his neck, <laughs> difficulty, squeezed, this stinks, I don't want to, literally, this stinks. I don't want to be here. What did he do? He practiced remembering the Lord. He practiced what? Looking, looking. 
from his circumstance to God. And he practiced praise and thanksgiving in the midst of his circumstance. The very last verse says, and God saw it, God heard it, and caused the whale to spit him out. Thankfulness changes everything. When you're thankful for your wife, when you're thankful for your kids, when you're thankful for your job, when you're thankful for your church, when you're thankful for your pastor, <laughs> when you're thankful for your house, you're thankful for your car. Seriously, guys, one time, man, I was in Indianapolis and I was driving my Yukon with 250,000 miles. And I was complaining. I'm like, man, I've had a Yukon since Trey was one. Trey's 15. <laughs> God stopped me, and he's like, do you realize you've never had to do a major repair on this car? I've never had to change the transmission, 300,000 miles. That car took us from Austin to Indianapolis when we moved there, to Florida every year for vacation, to Outer Banks every year for summer vacation, back and forth, da da da, da. And I just began, God, thank you. Put my hands on my GMC Yukon. Thank you, Jesus, for this Yukon that's safe. I've never had it. Praise God. Thankfulness changes everything. I have our worship team come up. We're going to go out with a song of thanksgiving. I know you guys loved it today because it was short and sweet. You're like, yes. We'll beat everybody to lunch. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Enter your courts with thanksgiving and your Gates with praise. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your power. Thank you for, Lord, everything that you've given us to, to us, life and breath. And, Lord, we just, we thank you this morning. Let our lives be, Lord, just not, not reflecting and focusing on the difficulty and the circumstances. But, God, you're above the circumstances. God, and let us have that perspective. God, let us be thankful people. Thankful in our homes, thankful in our workplaces, thankful as we go, thankful with one another. It's in your mighty name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.